It's the coldest hand that run down this land. Everywhere you go, I'll be. I'm the executive director at the Nevada Science Center, and I'm here with... I'm Dr. Josh Bondi. I'm the director of research. Today, we're going to be talking about desert wetlands here in Clark County, Nevada. We're at the, um, here at the Desert National Wildlife Refuge here um, at the Corn Creek Visitor Center. So today, we're going to be talking a little bit about desert wetlands, how they are created, and why are they so important to not humans, but also animals that live here? So Josh, you wanna talk about um, a little bit first? Sure. So like Becky said, we're here at the Desert National Wildlife Refuge Visitor Center at Corn Creek. So we are on the very Northern end of the, North, of the Las Vegas Valley. We're kind of situated between the Spring Mountains off to our West, which would be off this direction from the way I'm speaking to you. And off this way to the East, is the sheep range and the Las Vegas range. So what we're looking at here is we're at the very base of the mountains and you can kind of see all of the, the foliage, all of the plants that are kind of in the landscape here, which is not typical of a, uh, when you're looking across, if you were to turn the other way around and we see creosote, we see spiny fir sage, which is more typical of the Mojave region in this area. So a little bit of history, so we're on lands that are historically and to this day are considered the homelands to the Nuwu or the Southern Paiute. And as you go farther north into the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, lands that are uh, sovereign or at least homelands for my tribe, the Newe, are the Western Shoshone. So just to give a land acknowledgement to the people that have traditionally taken care of these lands before the, uh, before the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the Desert National Wildlife Refuge was created in 1936 is a large 2.2 million acre swath of land here in Southern Nevada. The original intent was to support desert bighorn sheep populations and associated wildlife along with those, uh, predominantly for hunting purposes, but also for conservation purposes as well. Uh, it turns out hunters are really a hunting community if you're not a member of that community. It actually does a lot to support conservation efforts when it comes to wildlife. Now, although originally 2.2 million acres, in 1940, about 800,000 acres was removed from the National Wildlife Refuge uh, and given to the Department of Defense for other purposes. So today the, the refuge sits at about 1.6 million acres, which is a large, it's the largest National Wildlife Refuge outside of Alaska, in the lower 48 of the United States. So it encompasses not only the Desert National Wildlife Refuge here, but also the Paranagate National Wildlife Refuge, the Moapa Valley National Wildlife Refuge, and over closer to Death Valley, the Ash, Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. So again, these are areas that are set aside for conservation of wildlife. So what is a desert wetland? A desert wetland is an otherwise wet oasis in a desert landscape. So if you've watched any of our programs before, oftentimes we're in the desert, we see trees, so we don't see many trees in the background, but these are landscapes that are actually dominated by water. So where does this water come from if we're in the desert? So what controls where wetlands occur? Number one, geology. And so as a good geologist, it's the rock underneath our feet and the structures that control where the mountains are around us that also control where the water is on the landscape. Number two is climate. So throughout the last 2 million years, ice ages have come and gone. And with those ice ages, so have various wetlands across the desert Southwest. And that's just a matter of whether or not we get more rain or snow in our surrounding mountains. And then finally, both of those factors, the geology and the climate control the water table. So the water table is the depth below our feet where groundwater starts. And so that's where you dig a well, and you're pumping water out of the ground. Where does that water actually start? Water table in this area. So let's talk a little bit about the geology first. So how do springs form? So we're a little bit up here on the alluvial fans. So if we look here at this the map of the, of the refuge, we're sitting right here on the edge of these desert of the 
of a very arid landscape. So we're at the edge of the alluvial fans, the toes of the alluvial fans here. Las Vegas being down here, we're up here. So what controls where these wetlands occur? Again, is geology. So what occurs here in the desert, and, and not just in the Mojave Desert, but in many deserts across the world, is that in the higher elevations, we get rain and snow in the higher elevations. So here in the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, some of the higher altitudes get up to 10,000 feet in elevation. So up there, we still get lots of snowpack during winter time. Can you see the board? Yeah. So what controls where these springs occur? It's, it has to do directly with where the mountains are. So here we are at the base of the Sheep Mountains, down into the Corn Creek Flats below. The Sheep Range. So number one is a good geologist. I, here. In the Great Basin, we can lower the camera just a little bit. A little bit more. There we go. That's perfect. So what controls where the mountains are are faults. And so these each of these mountain ranges across the Great Basin of Nevada and Utah and California are what we call normal faults. So these are breaks in Earth's crust that accommodate stresses that are being affected by uh, different tectonic processes further afield. That's a, probably a topic for a different virtual field trip. But just because we know that the crust is stretching in this area, we know that the valleys in these areas across the Great Basin are down dropping, so dropping in elevation in relation to the mountains, which are uplifting. Now up here, the elevations that get up to 10,000 feet we got snow and rain all falling on these areas during the winter time. And then during the summertime, when we get snow melt, all that, all that snow begins to melt. And that water percolates down through the alluvial fans, starts to flow in the subsurface down through the alluvial fans until it encounters these faults. And it encounters these faults. As faults move, they grind up. As they grind up the surrounding bedrock, they make kind of a clay layer. It's called fault gouge. So this clay layer is actually impenetrable to the water. So the water can't get past it. So when the water hits this fault, it builds up pressure and then bubbles up as a spring. So even though we're not in the lowest part of the valley, the reason the faults are here, or the reason the springs are here, is because this is roughly where the faults reach the surface of the, of the earth. So geologically, that's what's controlling them. So this is where the water table, the local water table, intersects the surface. So the groundwater is right below our feet, right in this neck of the woods. Now the other variable of climate. So over the last two million years, uh, we've seen fluctuations on about a hundred thousand year scale as glaciers advance and glaciers recede. It also increases the amount of precipitation here across the desert southwest. Now, great big continental glaciers like set on Canada during the last major ice ages never came this far south. But because they were so immense, they actually drove climate further afield. And so moist air masses came farther south than they do today. That moist air dumped on the mountains around us, increasing the amount of water in the landscape and making these springs more active. So if you go to places like Tule Springs, which is right now outside of Las Vegas, those were springs that were active up until historical time because of the climate differences. Now, because climate has dried up over the last 10,000 years in particular, those springs have gone dry. But we just happen to be here at Corn Creek where some of these fault controlled springs are still active. So there's still enough precipitation up in the sheep range, in the Las Vegas range, that feeds these, these natural springs here in this part of the world uh, still to this day. And so humans can actually directly impact the water table through water usage. But this isn't just a problem in the Las Vegas Valley. This is an issue across every desert landscape where there are human populations. So probably where you live, if you're anywhere in Nevada, there's probably a well someplace nearby which, which provides water for your city. When you're pumping groundwater out, 
you all, you can also draw down the water table. So if you're pumping out more water than is being recharged every winter by snow and rain, then the water table gradually declines. So it'll go farther and farther in the subsurface. You have to do, you have to drill deeper and deeper wells. And in some cases, wells can actually go dry if the water table drops too low. If a well goes dry, it's pretty much done for because it. then it's sucking up uh, gravel and dirt and can ruin all the pumps and it really all the sediment compacts and then it really doesn't hold water all that well anymore. In Southern Nevada, this was a major issue. And if you live in the Central Valley of California, this is still a major issue. It's called subsidence. And so as you remove water from the subsurface and the sediment packs, you can actually lower the elevation of a surface. So there's some really dramatic examples of this near Sacramento, California. But there's also dramatic examples in the Las Vegas Valley as well, where there was enough subsidence that there was actually surface fissures that opened up in places like uh, North Las Vegas, which uh, ended up having to condemn a couple of houses, housing communities uh, during that period of time before they started regulating groundwater a little bit more. So what controls where springs form, where desert wetlands form? Geology. So are there faults underneath us? What's the type of rocks? Climate. How much precipitation is available to our landscape? And then finally, the water table. So how, how, how close is the water groundwater to our feet on the subsurface? And so that's going to control what Becky's going to talk about here next. All right. Let's see. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the animals that um, thrive or depend on these desert oases. So not just humans. So there's been ranchers here. Um, throughout time and like uh, Josh said, indigenous people that took care of this land. Um, but animals depend on this desert oasis too. So not just recent or modern animals, but prehistoric. So Josh talked a little bit about, um, you know, the ice age here in Las Vegas was not the glaciers, but it was a lot wetter. So it really charged those springs up, which brought like mammoths in, um, camels, horses, giant ground sloth. But all you find these uh, watering holes or, or oasis is um, to drink and to um, gather food. So today we have, like Josh said, we have bighorn sheep. So bighorn sheep, this is a very important place for them because they come down from the mountains. They, can, they don't need to drink water every day. They can go, I think, like 60 days without water. Um, but they come down and they can get a sip of water. Um, we also have smaller mammals here in the desert. So kangaroo rats. Um, hares, so rabbits that, that, and foxes and coyotes that utilize the water. Um, and it's also an important uh, place for birds and waterfowl. So they come here for migratory paths. Um, and we talked about a little bit of that in our past uh, virtual field trip, but water is a very, very important source for uh, birds and ducks for when they're migrating north and south. So, uh, we have different, uh, also in this ecosystem, we have different plants that, that thrive here. So we, like Josh was saying, we don't have the big trees. We have some yuccas around. I don't know if we can turn. Maybe we can turn. Oh, behind us. Oh, I didn't even notice the huge one behind us. Um, mesquites, um, salt brush, and I forgot what this one's called. What was this one called? Spiny bursage. Spiny bursage. So these are all important because not only do, are they, they're also create habitats for the animals too. So this desert refuge is very important for some of the bigger mammals, we would say, but they're also important for the really, really small animals. So uh, we have in these springs, pupfish. So pupfish are, can some of them only live in certain springs. So if you've ever heard of the devil's pupfish, uh, devil's hole pupfish. So it's one a hole or spring that uh, is a habitat for one species of pupfish called the desert uh, devil hole pupfish. And it's very, very important because it's found nowhere on earth. So a lot of uh, scientists take care of the pupfish, monitor the pupfish, um, so we don't lose them. Because as Josh was saying, when water is pumped out um, in wells, so whether it's ranching or drinking water or water usage from humans, it also lowers that water table in the, the habitats for these pupfish. So they're um, well monitored. So it also, uh, so for us, coming here at the de desert refuge, we can go birding or look for birds. We can enjoy these trails. So I encourage everyone to come out here. 
because there's a whole bunch of walking trails in back where you can see some of these animals. You can see uh, the plants that live here. And then there's also a little tank back there where you can look at the pupfish. So I think, should we do questions? Yeah, so why don't we shoot back to, because I'd rather answer your questions than just ramble on. So I'll shoot back to Ralph and then we'll ask him, answer some questions about desert wetland. You guys are doing great and this is exciting. It seems uh, like it's a lot of fun out there in the desert. One of the students already messaged some questions and you guys can keep them coming. Um, they wanted to know, how does a drought affect the life cycle in the desert? So, drought is obviously uh, just a natural part of living in a desert. So we kind of just the definition of being a desert is that we get less precipitation or less rain and snow than is actually used by the landscape. But droughts in particular, like the one we've had over the last 20 years, has the effect of lowering naturally, aided by people as well, the lowering of the regional water table. And so just through droughts, we can actually dry up springs as well. It also stresses local animal populations that have to come in closer to human populations to get water in, from wells that may have, or springs that may have dried up higher up into altitude. Also, it stresses the plants as well. So only those plants with the deepest roots or those that can kind of have enough stores to get through the tough times are going to come through droughts like this. And so, yeah, droughts do have a significant impact on the life cycles of a number of organisms, including people in desert landscapes. So in uh, past edutainments, you guys have mentioned that prehistorically Nevada was underwater and there was a lot more water here. And obviously now in Nevada, it's a desert. Um, what is in store for the future of Nevada since it's taken that trajectory? So it also depends. So our earth changes over time, our landscapes change over time. So there's a lot of different elements that depend on uh, our climate and our precipitation levels. So for us, we are in a very, very big drought. So even though we're in the Mojave Desert and we only usually get four inches of rain, I think we're going on like the third or fourth year in a row where we're way under even that average. Um, so hopefully, sometimes it only takes a couple, um, you know, a couple summers we have a, a different uh, weather pattern to come in to, to cure the, the drought, but it's also um, adjusting as humans and uh, our ecosystems the natural um, plants and animals, they're adapted to handle different stresses. Um, so when, when there is a desert, um, they'll find, you know, different sources. Uh, they come down, maybe more animals are coming down to the springs. But for us, uh, it's also, the Mojave Desert is created by a big rain shadow. So it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, climate change or human influence. We, like I said, we always have a little bit less water from these, uh, the rain kind of drops down on the mountains before it gets to the valleys. Um, but in, the, in store for the future, the best we can do as humans is just conserve water and be water smart and um, try to conserve the water we have so we can get through these droughts. And we had uh, one of the students, a lot of these students here are from Italy and um, they wanted to know if there were wetlands in Italy. Um, to which I did find a website that had a list of wetlands across the country of Italy. Um, can you tell us, because we're in a desert, obviously Italy is not a desert, how can wetlands be formed in different biomes? Right, so it's the same principles that occur here in the desert. So it's geology. So what are, what's the, are there, are there faults in the subsurface? Or is there different types of rock types in the subsurface? So geology, precipitation or climate, so the amount of rain or snow you get in a given an area, so the amount of water in the landscape, and then the water table. So does the water table or the groundwater reach the surface anywhere, or does it not? So the same principles apply no matter where you're at in the world. These, so it works in the desert, it works anywhere you're at. And for any students that we have on here that are interested in studying science, Josh and Becky, uh, you guys, your background is primarily in paleontology, but you guys obviously know a heck of a lot about the environment, geology, and all that. Can you kind of speak on knowing all the different uh, facets that kind of have to do with paleontology? Hence the reason why you're quite knowledgeable on these subjects. Yeah, so to be a paleontologist, right, you study rocks uh, or fossils, right? So that's bones or fossils, animal past life, in rocks. And so you have to be a good geologist. 
So both me and Josh have taken um, our coursework in geology and biology. So you have to understand it. You can't understand the past without understanding uh, today, right? So the way the systems work, so environmental systems, biomes, how they work today are the same ways they worked a million years ago, 5 million years ago, you know, 500 million years ago. So that hasn't changed. Um, it's just the animals that exist uh, today are different than they existed prehistorically. Absolutely. And before, while we have you guys still here connected, can you guys uh, give any word of advice to these students who are interested in studying science? What, what kind of things should they be pursuing at, in middle school and high school? Yeah, you bet. So if you're interested in science, the science classes come easy. They're fun. They're in, interesting. So they, it should be the, the fun classes you take. As a professional scientist, the classes that might not be as intuitive do good in your math classes. You can't do science without math. So if your math's a little bit difficult, find a tutor, find somebody that can explain it a little bit better. Math a lot of times comes from who's teaching it to you. Also, one that's kind of not very intuitive is your language classes. So you're reading and writing. You might be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't communicate, nobody's gonna know that. So work on your communication skills, math skills, the science come easy. Yeah, and just go out and, um... You know, besides being at school and the coursework that your your teachers are giving you, read on your own. Go out and and, and to you know a nature preserve. Look around. Um, just be more, be observant of the world around you. And before we let you go, um, can you guys tell us about uh, if they want to learn more about the Science Center? We obviously have it in the chat. You guys can check that out. And there's also a sign up list for their email list if you want to join their their email list. Um, where can they go so we can have it in the video if uh, they want to learn more about the Nevada Science Center? All right. So that's a great start, Ralph. Uh, so head to our website. We have some resources on there, um, upcoming events. Uh, we also have our, for those who are local, we have our paleontology lab in downtown Henderson. So you can look us up there. And um, if you are on social media, social media too, and YouTube. So we, uh, Ralph will put this up on YouTube and we'll get those uh, so you can watch these again or share with your friends or other classmates. And then, uh, yeah, just, just, you know, check us out.